thank you all for inviting me. Um, I've had an opportunity to go through go to a number of different conventions in the last couple of years. Um, Indiana, South Dakota, Kansas, Colorado. I'm going to Colorado again in two weeks. Um, two weeks after that, I think I'm going to be whenever it is. I'm going to be in Houston. I'm at the Texas one. I'm um, early. August or April, and then I will be in Houston the following week. I'm going to spend a lot of time in Texas in April. Um, I'm going to be in uh, Houston again for a Young Americans for Liberty um, event. So um, I've had a lot of fun going around and getting to know libertarians. Libertarians around the country are, are the same and different in different ways, so um, maybe we'll get into that a little later. But I do want to thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Bill started the story, um, but let me tell you a little bit more about how I became a big L libertarian. Um, I was what has sometimes been referred to in Nebraska at least as a legacy Republican. And what that really means is that um, I grew up in a family um, that had a long history, um, probably going back. Um, but I know I can I can verify at least to who Herbert Hoover and probably back to Abraham Lincoln, um, who had been Republicans going that far back. Um, my I grew up in a family of Goldwater Republicans. Um, I was a baby in the 1964 election. My dad was a college student at the time, um, and apparently got turned on to Ayn Rand um, around that time because my younger sister's middle name is Ayn. Uh, my younger brother's middle name, and which what we've always called him by, is Barry. So um, it was sort of a theme there for a while in, in my family of, of five siblings. Um, without going into a lot of details, uh, my, between my grandfather, my dad, my mom, and um, we had about a 40-year streak in my, our hometown where one of them was the chair of the county Republican Party. And the others served at different times as mayor, both my dad and my grandfather, um, on the school board, my mom and my grandfather, on city council, actually both of my grandfathers had been on city council at one point. And this wasn't in a village of a hundred, it was in a class one city of over 5,000 at the time. So I grew up in and around a lot of political things. Now we lived about four blocks Part of my story is kind of boring, maybe, but uh, I think you have to hear it to, to, to at least understand where I'm coming from. Um, my dad's law office was, um, was what was was between what was a little bit beyond where my elementary school was, and this was back in the days when we still had open campus, and so we went home for lunch every day, and so my dad would time his walk home from his office so that he would be passing by the elementary school as we were dismissing. And then my dad and I would walk home and we'd talk about politics. I've always been a political nerd. Um, and, and so um, we'd talk about politics, we'd talk about um, Congress, we'd talk about you know, all sorts of things. So in 1980, I cast my first vote for Ronald Reagan, um, who, while certainly not without some flaws, had a much deeper understanding of what um, I will call the ideas of liberty than any president since. Um, in college, I started down an academic path uh, of politics rather than an activist path. Um, bachelor's, master's, and eventually a PhD in political science. Um, although in my youth I had harbored some grand and glorious notions of running for political office, um, I, I had the opportunity to teach in grad school and really enjoyed that. So I kind of set the activism piece aside for a while. I did, however, when we returned to Nebraska after my husband's um, military time, um, I, I did run for the school board in my hometown in 2002, and I served um, three terms, uh, 12, year, uh, 12 years total, on the school board until I was elected to the legislature in 2014. So, long story short, libertarian. Um, well, it won't be so short. Um, <laughs> But in 2008, I got involved in the Ron Paul campaign. Um, my small L libertarian roots were sprouting again as an activist, and frankly, the budding libertarian movement, I thought, in Nebraska needed some serious help, um, especially as it existed within the Republican Party. So I served as one of a core group of leaders um, that stirred things up a little bit in the Nebraska GOP convention in 2008. 
And we managed to elect a couple of Ron Paul delegates who went to the National Convention in Minneapolis. And the Republican Liberty Caucus was formed um, in Nebraska, and we set about trying to change the Republican Party from inside. It's like, well, that really shouldn't be that tough to do. You're Goldwater people, right? Um, well, not so much. Um, in 2012, we tried again, and we had about the same level of, of success. The Republican Party establishment was waiting for us, um, and while we had grown, we hadn't grown enough to really make a difference. Um, in the spring of 2013, my dad called me up. My dad lives in my district. Um, he lives in our hometown. Um, I, I've got a four-county district, and he lives in our home district, which is this district just to the south of the district, of the, the county that I live in now. So in the spring of 2013, my dad called me up, and he made a suggestion. He said, hey, you know, um, Senator Karpachek, who was the uh, incumbent, um, is term limited in 2014. I said, why don't you run? And I kind of laughed it off at first because I really had never had any real interest in, in state politics. Um, I served on the school board in large part because I thought it was a, um, something that you do as a community service to give back to your community. I live in a town of 7,000 people, and I thought, okay, I've got kids in the school, and it's, it's a good civic investment, right? Um, so things you need to understand about the Nebraska legislature, some of us have talked about it, and we talked about it a little bit this morning. We have only one house, made up of 49 members, and we call ourselves senators. Not for any good reason, I guess, but because that's what we do. Um, it's, it's, it's been that way since 1937, when the first, um, first one-house legislature came into being in Nebraska. Um, we have term limits, um, two four-year terms, and then you have to sit out for four years. But you can return, and we do have one member who has done that before. Um, we are officially nonpartisan. In other words, on the ballot, there is no indication of party affiliation, which is not to say that the parties don't get involved, because they do especially if the two finalists are from opposing parties. But you also um, see a fair number of Republican versus Republican and Democrat versus Democrat races um, in certain parts of the state. So, in 2014, I decided to run, um, and I won in a race where about 12,000 votes were cast by 167 votes. Um, it was very close. Um, I was the last race in the state to be called. Um, it was, I lost the county that I live in. Um, it's a largely Democrat county. My opponent was a Democrat, and I lost it by a 60 to 40% margin. Fortunately, my home home county, um, I got about 68% of the vote, and in the county next to it, um, which was the uh, smallest county, I got 70% of the vote. Um, that said, um, at one point, uh, we were within uh, two votes um, for about two hours because they had trouble. Of course, we, got to, we were within two votes of each other, and then one county, which I believe would be my strong county, and it ended up being um, the voting machines had a problem. So they had trouble counting. And so for hours, we're sitting there and just keep, keep showing two, uh, two vote difference. Um, but I thought I was going to win at midnight that night, and about 2.30 the race was called. Um, we, um, we were within about 40 votes of triggering an automatic recount. So what does a libertarian Republican who's barely won um, do when they've been elected to an officially nonpartisan legislature, and the governor, who was elected at the same time, is what you would call maybe a more traditionally conservative um, Republican? Well, this is where things really got interesting. Um, in my first session, I was assigned to the Judiciary Committee, um, the Business and Labor Committee, and the Urban Affairs Committee. In Nebraska, you, you serve, um, we have five days of committee hearings a week, and you have to be busy all five of those days. So some of our committees are three-day hearings, uh, some, days, some of them are two, some of them are one. And so you have some mixture. And so I ended up on urban affairs, which, you know, coming from a rural, um, a rural district, that seemed kind of strange, but that's the way we do things. So um, first up, Judiciary Committee. That's where I got myself into the most trouble. Um, first up was the death penalty repeal. 
Um, Nebraska has had a death penalty on the books forever. And in the late 90s, they switched from the electric chair to lethal injection by statute. So it's in statute. But that's the only way we can put someone to death in Nebraska. Um, and and, and, and um, we haven't had an execution since we put that into statute. Um, because the state hasn't been able to procure the drugs needed and, and that sort of thing. They haven't been able to figure out what to do. So it's been almost 20 years since we've had a, a, uh, an execution in Nebraska. So um, when I was running, I really didn't think that this was going to be an issue. Um, nobody asked me about it at the door. Nobody asked me about it at town halls. I had one survey from the Nebraska Catholic Conference which asked what I would do um, were there to be a, a bill dealing with the death penalty. And I said to them, honestly, and I'm glad I have it on the record, that I thought that it was a bad policy for the state to kill people who were already incarcerated and not a danger to the larger society. <laughs> and then the repeal of the death penalty was introduced, and it came to the Judiciary Committee. Now, the senator who introduced it really didn't think it was going to go anywhere. Um, he'd been doing this. Um, he, he's the one that had been around forever. Um, he's been in, in office for 38 years, and he sat out four years when we introduced term limits back in the early 2000s, and then he came back. So he was in the middle of his first term um, when we were um, when we when, when I came into the office. So he introduced his um, annual death penalty bill, and he didn't think it was going to go anywhere. Well, he was surprised because. Um, there were a group of us, um, some more conservative senators, if you, you know, if you will, who joined forces with the more progressive types on the Judiciary Committee, which um, was the first strike against us, I guess. Um, so, so we, uh, we we joined forces. We moved the bill out of committee, but then we moved it to the floor, and it came up for debate. And we, the assumption was it was just going to die, and it did. Um, we had enough to invoke cloture. Um, we had a two-thirds um, majority um, that would go along with, with stopping a filibuster on it. Um, and then it went to the governor's desk. He vetoed it, and then we overrode him. Um, and he didn't like that either. Um, and so we actually did we actually did repeal the death penalty. Unfortunately, the governor decided, um, and, and his his father. I told some of you this. His father is the person who founded TD Ameritrade. Um, and who is also himself a co-owner of the Chicago Cubs, um, he decided to toss some of his personal money into a referendum on the death penalty. He lost politically, and so he decided to, um, to, to go to the people and, and finance a referendum on the death penalty. Um, they collected signatures with paid volunteers, an oxymoron. So, um, um, and, and put repealing the repeal, on the ballot in 2016, and the mass of voters being what they are, they reinstated the death penalty by about a 65 to 35 margin. Now, so we have the death penalty back on the books. We still haven't had an execution. Um, I also got into trouble with the governor when I voted in 2015 to allow driver's licenses for those who had the DACA status. Um, Nebraska was one of about three or four states that had not allowed that yet, and it only makes sense. My district um, has a high immigrant population on the school board. I signed a lot of um, diplomas for kids who had DACA status, I'm sure. And so it only made sense to me that, okay, they're here. They've been vetted. They have this DACA status. Why don't we let them drive? You know, so they can work and be productive. Um, the governor didn't much like that. Um, and in 2016, um, I also allowed those same kids be eligible for occupational licensure in the state, something that we hadn't done then either. And um, in both of those cases, we passed it, the governor vetoed it, and then we overrode. So um, we've got this, um, it, we have sort of an interesting, even though you've got a fairly conservative legislature, um, we have this kind of unique, um, in, in the 2015 and 2016 sessions, um, you had a conservative legislature that was thinking for itself, and you had a governor who didn't much like that it was thinking for itself. And so what he did in 2016 um, was he targeted a few races. He targeted some Republicans who voted against him who were up for re-election, and he won. Um, he essentially, 
heavily influenced, um, um, three races. Um, so we had a turnover of three sort of moderate Republicans became, um, they became three very conservative Republicans who now listen to what the governor has to say. So in, in the spring of 2016, the Libertarian Party, um, let me just add, we did two other things the governor really wasn't real keen about. Um, and they probably got me into trouble. Um, I, I co-sponsored a bill for medical marijuana, which still hasn't passed, but, you know, anyhow. Uh, and then we um, passed a bill to get rid of civil asset forfeiture in the state. Woo! And the, the, the civil asset forfeiture um, was really kind of quietly opposed by some of the administration, including the Attorney General. But ultimately, it was passed and signed into law. So we got rid of that. In the spring of 2016, the Libertarian Party of Nebraska invited me to come and speak to their state convention. Now, um, remember, I was still a Republican at the time. And I'd run into a lot of these folks during the two Paul campaigns. And we ran in a lot of the same political circles. So I figured, hey, why not? You know, at least somebody likes me. I wasn't really feeling very liked at the time in, in the GOP. Um, so, so I spoke, and, and there was no pressure at all. But Ben Backus, um, who is now, um, by the way, a city councilman in Garing, Nebraska, libertarian councilman, city councilman in Garing, Nebraska, just sort of sidled up quietly to me um, during while we were standing in line at lunch. And he said, you know, if you ever feel unwelcome in the GOP, we'd be happy to have you. Okay, thanks. Um, now, recognize that this was at about the same time that um, the Johnson campaign seemed to be wrapping up the LP nomination. And while I fully recognize the weaknesses and limitations of the Johnson campaign and the human failings of the candidate, I've run into Governor Johnson a number of times during my Republican Liberty Caucus days. Um, and he'd even come to Nebraska and spoken at one of our events as a fundraiser before he switched parties. And I, I really, really like the guys. Um, and this is also at the same time that the Trump train was going strong. It seemed to be unstoppable. And there was absolutely nothing <laughs> philosophically that I could find to like about the idea of him being my party's nominee. So I went to the Nebraska GOP convention in early May. And I played nice. Um, I stood and I clapped at all the right times when our senators got up to speak and you know, all that sort of stuff. And then our governor got up. Keep in mind, he doesn't like us that much, right? Um, in a convention where, to my way of thinking, you know, conventions, in my humble opinion, uh, when, are, are supposed to be times, especially in presidential years, are supposed to be times when you bring people together. It's when the disparate groups say, hey, let's rally around the candidate, let's go out and win one for the Gipper, you know, Liberty or whatever. Um, and, and he got up and he called out 13 state senators. And um, he called us out by name. You know, he went down a laundry list, you know, Senator Epke, Senator Reedby, Senator, I mean, he went down the whole list. Um, and he said that we had not been adequately platform Republicans, and that um, it was time for the party to start electing more platform Republicans. Okay, that sealed the deal for me. Um, I walked out, I went home, we have online voter registration. I went home and I switched parties, um, about a week later. <laughs> Republican Party was no longer a big tent party, um, where those with libertarian leanings were part of the family. The Libertarian Party, the, the Republican Party was just, they were just out there, okay? They were no longer, they, they no longer wel welcomed me to even be part of the family. Um, now, I wanted to send letters to my supporters to let them know what I was doing. I thought I owed them that, at least. I wanted to control the messaging to my constituents as much as possible. So. While the Libertarian Party was in, um, where were you, Orlando, um, at, the end of, at the end of May, um, I, I made the formal switch. I sent the letters out to my um, constituents, and I made a call or texted Ben Backus, and I said, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm switching parties, um, and 
Um, the word got out in the Nebraska delegation pretty fast, and um, David Demarest, who is the uh, who is the, the the leader of the gang, I guess, at the convention that year, got up and he announced that um, that Nebraska was the home of the you know the newest libertarian state senator, blah blah blah. He didn't name my name. He just said that you know that somebody had switched, and um, and so uh, they announced it. And after that, it percolated for about two or three days, and all of a sudden, the press got wind up in Nebraska. I don't think they were watching the Libertarian Party convention, but I don't know. Um, maybe somebody was. I don't know. Anyhow, someone tweeted about someone who was switching parties, and I guess I was the prime suspect. So one afternoon, I was watching a movie with my daughter, and my cell phone rings, and it's the Omaha World Herald. And I go, huh. Yeah. So it's in June, we're not in session, right? So I answer the phone, and it's, it's this reporter, and he says, Senator Epke. Yeah. He said, I'm hearing rumors that somebody is switching parties to the Libertarian Party. Do you know anything about that? I said, you know, I'm kind of busy. Can I call you back in just a little bit? You know, and, uh, and so I hung up, and I was like, okay, now what do I do? Well, um, I, I sent out a quick email. Um, because the, the, I knew that the mail wasn't quite there yet. So I sent out a quick um, email to all of my supporters that I had email addresses for, and I said, this is what's happening. And I called the reporter back and told him the story. And um, Pretty soon I had three other reporters, reporters calling me, you know, good news travel, travels fast, I guess. So what were the political results of my switch? Well, not much, at least not yet. Um, but you can talk to me after our primary in May and the general election in November, and I'll tell you for sure what the results were. That said, um, with only a few exceptions, most of the people in my district have said, yeah, that's okay, we don't care, we know who you are, it's no big deal. Um, my colleagues haven't seen it as a big deal. They elected me chair of the Judiciary Committee, although that may have been punishment. Um, <laughs> the Judiciary Committee, um, we have 14 standing committees. Um, the Judiciary Committee, um, is the busiest committee with the broadest scope of legislation. This session, uh, we had 500 new bills introduced. We hear all bills in committee, okay? If a bill is introduced, somebody is, is hearing it. So we had 500 bills introduced, 102 of them came to my committee. Um, that, that's a lot. Um, so we got 20%. Um, so, but, 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 they, but, but my colleagues said, yeah, that's no big surprise. We always knew that's what you were anyway. Okay. <laughs> Um, the governor, of course, wasn't so happy. Um, he decided to run somebody against me, unsurprisingly. And on the final day for filing to run um, in March, on March 1st, another Republican got into the race. I don't know what that's all about. I think it's, I don't think it's governor-inspired, but I'm not sure. So um, our primaries for the legislature are the top to advance, um, since we have no party distinction there. So in theory, both Republicans could advance. I don't intend to have that happen, though. Um, so, I want to talk for just a few more minutes. Anybody bored? Let me stop. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I want to talk for just a few more minutes about how we advance liberty. How we can be libertarians and play the political game and move the needle in the right direction. Because I think that's really what we all need to be looking at. So, you probably all have at least a vague knowledge some probably not so vague, but a vague knowledge of the Kenny Rogers song, Gambler, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, this is a message that I kind of settle on. Um, and politics is a game. And um, hopefully there's some, some level of idealism involved, but ultimately, no matter what your ideas, in the game of politics, the secret to surviving is knowing when to play your cards, knowing when to walk away, and knowing when to run, right? So um, libertarians are, at least to my biased eyes, um, really, really, really smart, okay? They're also really, really, really idealistic in many cases. And we tend to let, like to let people know those things about us. Now, that could be dangerous, right? There's this movie image, and I don't know where it came from, um, I'm not sure which movie it was. It might have been Animal House. Um, it, it might have been a Mel Brooks comedy. It was a comedy, I'm sure. 
um, or it might have even been Monty Python. I, I <laughs> um, but at some point, um, someone mentions the German philosopher Schopenhauer. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? There's a line in this movie, and the character says, ah, Schopenhauer, and um, says it in a very knowing way. And everybody else in the room just looks at him with blank stares, like, what? You know, who's Schopenhauer? And honestly, I think that's the, 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 the feeling that people outside of libertarian circles get when they stumble into a gaggle of us, right? Um, you, you may have read um, the libertarian canon. You know, I don't, Bastiat, Hayek, um, whoever else is on the list or your list Rockport. these days. Um, um, Kokesh, I don't know. Um, but but, but they, they probably haven't. Okay, and their eyes glaze over. People in the real world really don't care that much about the great philosophers. Um, I've never once seen a conservative Republican quote Edmund Burke. Um, never. Um, what people really care about are simple ideas put simply. And, and that's the challenge that I think we in the Libertarian Party have in the coming years. And somehow we have to make um, those principles of liberty accessible to the broader public. Um, we have to do that, though, without scaring people away. Okay. So last year I was part of a panel um, at the LP Colorado Convention. And the question for the panel revolved around the idea of Liberty Town. And uh, in essence, if we had our own Gulch Gulch, um, what would it look like? And Austin Peterson was there, and Steve Kerbel, and, and Arvin. And, and um, to be honest, I really didn't contribute as much as I should have, because I live in a totally different world. Um, I don't live in a world where we can start from scratch. I live in a world where people have expectations of government building roads. You know? You know? Um, and providing schools. I live in a world where it's assumed that the government will license professions and will protect children from abusive parents. You know, I live in a world where people expect law enforcement to protect them. Ah. You know, they may not, but that's what we expect that's what we expect them to do. And they expect the state to punish people who violate them. You know, I live in a world not of a couple of hundred of my best friends and ideological soulmates getting together to create our own society. But I live in a diverse society where political philosophy spans the spectrum from near anarchist to pure collectivist. Okay, um, so, so how do we move in the direction of liberty? That's the big question for us, right? And I like to tell the guys and gals in the Libertarian Party of Nebraska that it's important to think incrementally. No matter how radical we are, individually and collectively, we need to think strategically as an, incrementally, okay? Um, we have to do for libertarian ideas what progressives have done for their version of the world, arguably since the beginning. Um, we are on a number line. I like to, I've got all sorts of analogies and sometimes they're mixed, I know. Um, but we, we're on a number line that stretches into infinity in both directions, okay? Think of pure liberty on one end of the line and pure statism on, at the other end and you never get to the pure, um, to the pure form. But you can pick where we're starting from today. Um, you know, whether it's on the liberty or the status side or in the middle or wherever you think we are. It doesn't really matter, okay? Um, it, it, it doesn't really matter where you say you're starting from. What matters is the direction that you're pointed in, okay? And, um, you know, you, want, you say you want liberty, don't expect, expect it to happen overnight. Don't expect a libertarian savior, whether it's Gary Johnson or Austin Peterson or Ron Paul or... Adam Kokesh, or, or whoever your favorite libertarian hero is. You know, it's not going to happen. Um, I always used to tell my Ron Paul supporting friends that even if Ron Paul had somehow gotten elected, and even if he had been re-elected at, at the end of his eight years, we wouldn't have been close to reaching libertarian nirvana. But we might have moved a few steps closer. And we might have moved a few steps in the right direction. And again, that's the number line. You know, your starting point today is zero. Wherever you are today, it's zero. Okay? 
Every political decision we make should revolve around this. Will it move us in the liberty movement in the right direction so that we can say we moved a step toward liberty? Or will it move the liberty movement backwards? Everything we do should be focused on that. Now sometimes we're going to guess wrong. Sometimes we'll move in the wrong direction. That happens. But I would argue that our goal in every decision, every public comment, every legislation supported or opposed, every candidate we run should be at least do no harm to liberty. Okay? And optimally, optimally, it should move us, even by the smallest of margins, in the direction of liberty. So, um, in a few minutes, I'll be happy to take some questions, um, and you can quiz me a little bit. But let me talk a little bit about the real world politics and give you a few examples from the Nebraska legislature. Because that's really what you all want to hear about, right? Um, <laughs> during the 2017 legislative session, there was a week when we had three big bills that had to do with economics. The first bill was a tax reform bill. Um, it would have provided for some marginal property tax relief. Um, our property taxes in Nebraska are crazy high right now. The farmers are going crazy. I mean, it would have reduced, um, beginning in a couple of years, the income tax rates for all taxpayers. The usual suspects um, got upset. Tax cuts for the wealthy. Um, and they sent out a graphics that showed that someone making $500,000 would get more money back than someone making $50,000. Never mind that those making $500,000 are already paying a lot more, right? And that if you cut the taxes of everyone in our relatively flat income tax structure in Nebraska by 1%, yes, those who pay more will get more back. Math is funny that way, right? Um, in the end, I had, uh, at the end of the, one of the days, I had sent my staff home. Um, it was 5.30 or 6 o'clock and nothing else was happening. And I was just getting the last of my things together. My office phone rang. Now, I usually don't answer the office phone. Nothing good ever happens when I answer my, hand, my own phone. Just nothing good ever does, and this was no exception. Um, a constituent wanted to argue with me about tax cuts. Okay. And she thought that the rich ought to pay a higher percentage, and all that sort of stuff. And I listened for a little while, and then I asked, what do you think is a fair amount to take away from these people? And first she said, well, they don't need 20 houses. Okay, fine, they don't need 20 houses. I don't know if anybody that has 20 houses, but okay, they don't need 20 houses. Um, I said, fine, but what's a fair percentage of their income for the state to take away from someone? This, I kid you not, was her response. You're not taking it away from them if it's taxes. <laughs> oh, the things that went through my head. I was a new libertarian, right? Um, um, the, the things that I really wanted to say, but I didn't. It wouldn't have been productive for me to say that. Um, it wouldn't have been productive for me to say taxation is theft. <laughs> Um, and it would have set me up for another 30-minute conversation that I really didn't want, to, didn't, didn't want to have anyhow. So instead I said, well, we'll probably just have to disagree on what the appropriate tax policy is, and I wish her a nice day. So how many in this room have ever been elected to public office? Good. Public, public elected office, like city council or anything like that. Okay, there we go. One, two, we got, a, we got a few that have been elected to public office. Um, inevitably, if you serve any length of time, you're going to find um, what a lot of libertarians do. And I've talked to um, Ben Backus and, and, um, and Gary, and he's finding this to be the case in Nebraska as well. That um, absent anarchy, a lot of the questions that we're faced with aren't really clear liberty versus non liberty. Okay? Constituents expect certain things. We can't just say no all of the time, because if we do, we'll not get reelected. Um, and yes, I know that Ron Paul was called Dr. No, but he also had um, a really great reputation for constituent service, and he picked his battles, and he didn't say no to everything, really. Okay? So rather than saying no, we have to keep our eyes on the goal. Lots 
more liberty over time. We need to make, uh, you know, have, make rational judgments about which battles are actually worth the fight. Pick your battles, okay? Um, now those decisions are going to differ from race to race, from issue to issue, and even across geographic boundaries. Um, I won't tell folks in Michigan which battles you should fight, okay? Please don't tell me in Nebraska which battles I should fight. We all have different battles um, th th that we're trying to wage to move towards more liberty, okay? Um, the goal should be that when we walk away from the political game, um, whether it's an issue game um, or an election, um, that we have a little bit more liberty than we had when we walked into it with, okay? Just like cars. Now, that doesn't sound a whole lot like going all in for liberty, does it? And I'm back to that gambling metaphor. And we're in a no gambling state. My, Nebraska's a no gambling state. Um, but if you look at so, so so that's probably why they're not very good uh, analogies. I don't know. But if you look at politics as only one hand and see um, always see every political decision as all or nothing. Um, and I know that libertarians are oftentimes inclined to look at things that way sometimes. Then more often than not, you're going to get nothing. Um, if you get nothing, you're not furthering the cause. You can only advance liberty if you can get more liberty. Um, and you can only do that if you're willing to say a little bit is better than nothing. Okay? So politics is a long game. Um, it's, it's not one hand. Um, in fact, played right, it's much more like sort of a multi-dimensional chess game than it is about cards. Um, we need to be able to look ahead and see what the results of our actions will be um, and what they will do for our end goal. Will demanding all or nothing win, um, all or nothing win people over to our side? I don't think so. Okay? Certainly not in Nebraska, it won't. Will saying taxation is theft ingratiate us to those government trusters on both the left and the right? No. I don't think so. Will saying that we don't need government to build the roads really help our cause when the paradigm says that government must be the planners of infrastructure? I don't think so. I don't think it helps us politically, okay? It may help us to talk about it. It may be good for us in our little libertarian class to, you know, remind each other. I've got a, my, my legal counsel for my committee, um, a guy by the name of Dick Clark. Really, that's his name. Yeah. Um, and and he, was, um, he was the Libertarian Party chair in Alabama when he was in college. He went to, um, he went to Auburn University, spent some time with the Mises Institute. Um, really great guy. And, but, but he's taken sort of a, a new role in my office. He's, he's fairly new this year. Um, and he's taken a new role in my office. And he, remind, he, says, that, he says that he is the, the Libertarian angel whispering in my ear. Um, because, because he'll come up to me and he'll say, Senator, you know, you could vote for this bill, um, or you could just sit it out, or you could, um, you know, the, the real libertarian view is this. He says, I understand if you don't vote that way. I mean, he's real cool about it. But, but he just reminds me that, you know, if I'm really going to go full libertarian, this is probably what I want to do. Now, I sometimes tell him, you know, I can't afford to go full libertarian in my district this, today. But... Um, but, but it's good to have somebody whispering in your ear and reminding. And I think that's why it's important to have organizations, you know, the party, you know, why it's important for people to get together with, um, with folks that they don't necessarily agree with on everything. And it's important to, you know, have, um, you know, the, 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 the different groups within the party talk to each other and kind of remind each other of what the real, um, the ideas of liberty are. But I would urge you to kind of set that a little bit apart um, from the political world, the world of actually trying to win elections and actually influencing public policy. Um, so if you really want to make more liberty, um, I have a couple of suggestions. First of all, I suggest that you get off of Facebook. <laughs> and other libertarians. You know, look at the end game. Um, the end game should be more liberty for our kids and grandkids than we have. I mean, that's, that's my view. Um, you know, I was one of those crazy people who loved the Johnson Weld team. Not because they were perfect libertarians, because I recognized fully that they were not. Indeed, I'm not really sure what a perfect libertarian is. 
Um, but when, if somebody can tell me, um, you know, all 20 of you can come up and you know give me your words. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but here were two former governors, governors, folks, um, who were willing to associate with us. Um, two former governors who understood what a real campaign that wins looks like. Okay, so were two former governors who had real governing experience that could lend credibility to the cause, okay? It's a big deal. Set aside um, their, their individual and team flaws, okay? They added, that they, there was a value added to the Johnson and Weld team, I think. So if we really wanna grow liberty, we need the Libertarian Party, I think, to be seen as people who can actually be responsible at governing, okay? Not as gadflies. Um, we do that by running people for city councils, you all are doing that, um, and school boards and county boards and get appointed to those local boards, um, and, and state legislative assemblies. And then, when they've developed a reputation for principled leadership, you run them for the next level up. That's the way parties have always done that. And to get people elected to those positions, um, we've got to do what the old parties did, okay? We need to recruit candidates, credible candidates, who are libertarians. We need to raise money for them. Um, I, I, um, I was interested to hear the discussion today about fundraising and how much you need to raise. I'm thinking, $5,000, what I, I would kill to only have to run a campaign, to, to, to be able to run a campaign with $5,000. In 2014, in my race, um, I had budgeted a campaign, um, a campaign budget of $45,000. I ended up spending ninety. dollars okay, so we had to raise a little more money than I originally intended. Um, this time around, um, we're going to have to raise probably close to $200,000 to win in a legislative district of um, 38,000 people. Um, and um, that pays twelve thousand dollars a year. <laughs> there's a certain there's a certain insanity that I get. Okay, but would you rather have? Would would people? You know, the question I always ask folks is, would you rather have me raise the two hundred thousand dollars, or would you rather have the governor's guy? Um, and that's you know that's the question you got to ask yourself sometimes. You know, who would you rather have? And if you're gonna if you want to wage a successful campaign, there's two ways to do it. You can do it through. You can do the media stuff, and you can do the mailings and all that sort of stuff, and you can knock on doors. Now, if you're not willing to knock on doors, you're going to have to spend more money on the other stuff. Um, but even if you do knock on all the doors, you're still going to have to spend some money. Um, campaigning is not cheap, dark signs are not cheap, and so on and so on. So we need to raise money. We need to knock on doors with people. Okay? Again, get away from Facebook and knock on doors. Okay? It's simple, okay, but not so simple. Um, we need to provide candidates with the resources that they need, and we need to encourage them to make the best decisions for less government that they can when they're elected without putting their credibility at risk. That's the danger that we always have. We hold people to these high standards that nobody can actually live up to. So we need to rinse and repeat, and we do that over and over and over again for as long as it takes. Now, I believe um, my, my doctorate degree is in political science, and I study um, political, I study presidential elections um, as, as part of my dissertation, but parties and, and institutions are kind of my thing. And I really do believe that the old parties have foundations that are cracking up right now. Um, they're becoming increasingly exclusionary, far right, far left. Um, and, and not a whole lot of friendliness in the middle. Um, people who were once welcome in, in one or both of those parties are becoming increasingly unwelcome. Um, some of those people who are leaving are becoming independents or nonpartisans. Some are looking at us and becoming libertarians. And we need to offer that third way for folks. We need to play the long game. If we run someone for president, sure. Um, but until we have proven that we can elect the libertarians to state legislatures and governorships and to Congress. <coughs> Don't expect miracles. Is it impossible? No. 
um, but it's it's not very likely. Um, you know, unless we've got a, another Donald Trump out there who's got billions to spend of his own money um, and is willing to, you know, it's just incredibly charismatic and charming or whatever it is that he is. Um, you know, <laughs> you know and until we've got somebody like that, you know, we've got we've got to show credibility and we've got to show that we can that we can do the job, um, and we can't do that without having some experience. So don't expect a lot. Um, our presidential candidates can help with respect to ballot access and the like. Um, but we can build our foundation the way that the old parties used to. We can do it from the ground up. Um, build your local parties. Wherever you are, if you're not in a place where there is an affiliate, make one. Okay? Um, register voters. Um, and I know you do things differently than we do in Nebraska. We actually register by party. But go out and register people who are libertarian-leaning. Tell them to go out and do whatever it is you do. Choose a libertarian ballot or whatever, however you do it with your election. Um, register more voters. Elect some state officials. Um, we need to show that not only are we principled, but also that we can be somewhat bigger tent principled. Okay? Um, you know, we're family. Um, I don't agree with y'all, and you probably don't all agree with me, and that's okay. If we're all working in the same direction for liberty, it doesn't really matter. Um, because anyone who wants less government and more freedom should be welcome. And in 20... For 30 or 50 years, we can start fighting with each other again. Uh, we can start fighting about who the real libertarian is. We can do like my governor did and call people out because they weren't adequately platform libertarians. But right now, there aren't enough of us to do that. Okay? We need to work together. So politics is the long game. Um, the long game isn't necessarily complicated, but it does require that you keep your eyes on the prize. Um, and you keep your eyes on the prize while you're taking actions that will move you in that direction. Um, and when you can look at liberty as a long game, that's when you know that you're ready to actually make more liberty. Because that means that you're willing to accept both the good and the bad that comes with politics with good humor. That you recognize that every action isn't going to be a big move. Some of them are going to be very small moves. I would implore you to take joy in the baby steps for liberty. Be willing to take a few more baby steps for liberty. Understand that not every move is going to be the winning move, and that sometimes you've got to move in the wrong direction in order to position yourself for a big move in the right direction. Now, sometimes you move in the wrong direction in order to keep from being destroyed. Um, because if that happens, you can never move in the right direction, right? So, I believe that... Uh, you know, those who are active in the party today, those who have um, been active for the last 40 years, um, those who are new to the party, I think, um, I think that we're the vanguard. Um, we are the tip of the spear um, in the long fight for liberty, and it's our job to start pushing through to puncture the, the two-party duopoly and, um, and, and to start the move, and those that come behind us will figure out their way in, but once we've opened the door for them. So, hey, I want to thank you all for inviting me here tonight. And I, I really do Who have suggested to me that they are interested 
and that they're watching very carefully what happens in my race. Um, because right now, I'm, the fear is that somebody who's switched parties um, has, has signed their own political death warrant. And so um, I'm going to work pretty hard to, to uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. So, but, but I think we might pick up another one or two, um, and certainly there will be other libertarians out there who, if we can win, if we can win re-election in my race, who will run in, in a later election cycle. So everybody's got to send money to our campaigns. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And we, we have, I, I had to laugh about your election laws too. Oh, um, sure. Nebraska's election laws are really loose. We have no limits. Um, we nice. can take it from pretty much anywhere. We just have to report anything over $250. So that, that's, that, that's the only limits that we have. Other questions? Yes. So you're what, two months after the primary? Yeah, yeah, May 15th. So what do Nebraska constituents think what you need in Michigan to um, Well, I didn't advertise it broadly. <laughs> um, but we're in the middle of session right now. So um, we've got things going on. Um, we did a lot of work back in um, November and December in the district. I've had several town hall meetings with my constituents. Um, they don't typically see a lot of me, except for town hall meetings this time of the year, just because we're in session. So, I don't think anybody's too concerned about it. I, I hope. Their weekend is still theoretically minor. It's also prime time for campaigning. Um, but the weather in Nebraska is just starting to get decent. Um, and we've got state state basketball tournaments this weekend, so it, it, we'll get several teams from my district, so I suspect that there won't be a lot of people at home. Did you say you only got paid 12000 a year, is it? Or what yes, was that 12000 $12, $12, a year. It's, a, it's constitutionally, um, uh, for, for most of my life, it was 4000 until about 1980, then they raised it to like 7200 and then in the mid-90s, I guess it was, they raised it to 12000 Every time there's any suggestion to change it, um, it gets voted down, so we quit suggesting it. <laughs> yeah, you know, Nebraska's a big state, and I think that the, that the salary does have a big impact, um, especially once you get outside the Lincoln and Omaha. Um, you know, Lincoln is the capital. Omaha is about an hour away from Lincoln. And so it's easy for people, and I, I don't want to live 30 minutes from Lincoln, um, but it's, it's pretty easy for people who live within a, you know, 35 to 65 minute um, drive from Lincoln to commute. Okay? But if you live out in Gary or Scott's Club, which is out in the Panhandle, what that means is that you have to either rent or buy a place in Lincoln to live during that time period. Um, and it takes you about seven hours to get from Lincoln out there. Um, and you've got a number of people out in the further west. So if you look at the demographics, um, you tend to have almost universally, the younger members of the legislature are from Lincoln and Omaha um, because they can still work a second job. Um, they can still be at home, be home at night with their families. They can still do things um, a, a little bit easier. Whereas, um, as you move further west, the population gets older, and they tend to be people who are retired or um, semi-retired farmers whose kids are taking you know, taking over during a lot of the. Yeah, it does affect. It does affect it for sure. Just to follow up that, do you perceive that as a good thing or a bad thing in general? Um, I think I think that it really limits the population. Generally speaking, I think it's now we're a part-time legislation. We serve 90, 90 day sessions and sixty day sessions. So, and I don't think we ought to be paying what eighty thousand here or something like that. Seventy two. Okay, um, but I think the upper house gets more, right? Um, same. Is it the same vote? $10,000. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So, so um, you know, it's a different, it, it's a little bit different situation. Um, you know, certainly you can't depend on this for your only source of income if you are um, still of working age. Um, I think it's, I think it's, there's a couple of ways to look at it. it it's a bad thing from the standpoint of limiting how many young folks from out west can participate. Um, but it's kind of a bad thing because it, if, if, if you had a higher salary, it would encourage people to become, you know, kind of permanent, full-time um, legislators. So even even as a even with a term limit, um, if you're getting paid seventy-five thousand dollars a year to um, to work um, in the legislature, that Congress looks a whole lot better than or something else was before. Um, just, you know, hearing the differences between Nebraska and Michigan, and I know you've been going to a lot of other uh, state conventions, do you think you're in somewhat of a more unique and, uh, in a way, privileged position to kind of keep going the direction you're going, whereas some other uh, already elected politicians who switched party got voted out instantly? It sounds like Nebraska is really the place to be. Uh, <laughs> So, um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, Nebraska's, Nebraska's situation certainly makes it a lot easier, um, potentially at least for me to win re-election, um, because you don't have the highly partisan nature um, in, in my particular um, circumstance. And I've been a resident of my district for probably 40 of my 56 years, and the ones that I wasn't was while we were in college and that sort of thing. So um, from that from that standpoint, um, you know certainly Nebraska is a good place to be. Um, I think you know you talk about um, uh, the assemblyman Moore out in uh, Nevada um, who lost re-election by a fairly um, substantial amount. Um, you know that when you have a partisan partisan race, um, that makes it all the more tough and. and um, he had some added problems, of course, with, with respect to kind of violating um, libertarian expectations, which is one of the things that's really tough to do, tough not to do when you're when you're a legislator, because you do have a lot of pressure that's put on you to do different things by different people, and you try very hard to be as pure as you can, um, to be as consistent as you can, but sometimes it's just. You know, you got people tearing you in three different directions, and, and there is no, um, there is no clear way. So. Did I answer your question, Jordan? Yeah. Okay. Um, Senator So I have a hard time envisioning what a what a two house legislature looks like, um, and so you know I, mean, I, I know Congress. I know I know that when I was um, they, they have a, a CSG, the Council of State Governors, run this um, it's called the Bowie Institute for Legislative Leadership <laughs> Development, and I was the one that got to go during um, my first um, my first two years, and they have. They have three representatives from each state in a 13-state area, Midwest, Michigan, and everybody else. And it was funny as we were sitting and talking, now what did you get to do during your first term? You know, we were supposed to sit around our table, like, you know, a table like this, and we were supposed to talk with our fellow legislators from other states about, you know, what their great accomplishments were um, during their first term of, you know, term of office. And, um, you know, one of them from, I think, Kansas said, well, um, I got to introduce this bill that the speaker gave me. Okay, that's nice. You know, um, and, and and another one said, "Oh, I got to write the floor speech for the minority leader when they did this." Okay, that sounds pretty exciting. Then they got to me, and I said, "Well, my first session, I introduced ten bills, and four of them became laws." You know, I mean, it's, just, it's a different, it's a different world. 
um, because um, because um, in our system, because you don't have that party aspect of it, you can introduce every senator can introduce whatever they want, and um, and then it goes through the committee process and is vetted. And if our committees are doing their job right, um, the bad bills don't come out to begin with. Because we have this cloture rule, because we have the, the on filibusters, um, it, it, it's likely that most bills are going to end up. Uh, Dying if they're really bad, anyhow. I, 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 I'm not a big fan of. One of the reasons why George Norris, who's the one that's kind of the father of the unicameral, why he pushed for that, was because he was he's a U.S. senator and he didn't like the conference committees that Congress had, and you know he didn't want that to happen in the state level so, because it was done behind closed doors. Okay, we're about done. Okay. Kind of a comment and then a question. I've been running for office since 92, and I've always focused on money. My power, control, and access to our income that the politicians have. I had a model uh, the past couple of years where it said our car insurance was too damn high. I got a good, a good feedback. So my question is this, does it matter of the age of the person or persons you are speaking to? And give me a, uh, is it yes or no, is it, does it matter? Yes. Uh, the, okay, in, in what way does it matter based on the, on the money issue? Well, I mean, that's part of the, the art and science of politics. Um, you know, if, if I'm talking, you know, I may have the same message, but I may frame it a little bit differently depending on whether I'm speaking to the seniors at, um, at the local retirement home versus the high school class. Um, you know, I may ask more questions of the high school kids to see what their thoughts of the issue are before I explain mine, um, when I have to listen a whole lot more um, to what the seniors have to tell me. You know, they, they, they aren't afraid to tell you things. Yeah. My main focus on was, for instance, property taxes. I would inform the uh, listener or the questioner, for instance, how smart is it to increase your property tax or to pay a tax on your property when in actuality it is not your property if you're paying taxes on it. Yeah. And um, again, based on the age of the person, the light bulb will come on for a young person. For an older person, I see fear if they're not paying taxes on their property. Yeah. Um, now, you have, first of all, you have to define property taxes because property taxes in different states are different. Okay. So in Nebraska, um, our property taxes are local taxes. Okay, they're taxes that are collected by the local school districts, um, cities, and counties, and they are property. They are taxes on all property. So farm ground, houses, um, any real property. Um, so, so yeah, part of the problem is when we start talking about property taxes, we start talking sort of apples and oranges sometimes that we aren't talking about the same thing. Um, it's really important, you know, in my district, I've got a lot of farmers, okay, and they really don't like the fact that our property tax rates, uh, that our property tax, that their property tax assessments have gone up, because constitutionally, property taxes in Nebraska um, are assessed based on the market value of the property. So, the county assessor comes in and says, um, okay, your neighbor across the road sold his ground for $9,000 an acre. That means that your property is worth $9,000 an acre, even if it's been in your family for the last 100 years. Um, and so all of a sudden, their property valuations go up. When their valuations go up, and the, the, the tax asking for the, by, the local, um, by the local taxing authorities don't go down, that's when they really yell. So, um, so, so yeah, and you have to know your crowd. When I go out and talk to farmers, I... I, I um, I dance around those issues a lot more than when I'm talking to um, the local college students who don't own any property. So, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Research that a little bit. <laughs> I, yeah, I remember, I remember that part. I just don't. Oh, that's that one. Okay. That was that was that was that the last. Office.
Osborne year? Okay. It was Nebraska. Nebraska was right. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain based solutions including DTube and you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com and if you want help getting a leg up there I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at and we'll share it on my feed.